Good morning, everyone. My name is Somri Dijk. It's my great pleasure to uh, introduce this uh, LPEG award session. It's the third time that we're awarding an LPEG award, and we only do that to people who have greatly contributed to the field of uh, uh, ethical, psychosocial, and legal aspects in genetics, hence the name LPEG award. And uh, Celine, uh, on to you. Thanks, Sam. It's my great privilege to be here today, even in a virtual capacity for this special occasion. I first met Heather back in 2006. I was speaking at a workshop as part of the Eurogen test project, presenting some work in which I had assessed written patient information provided at the genetic clinic and relating to genetic testing. Heather came up to me at the end of the talk, introduced herself and asked me if I'd ever thought about doing a PhD, to which I replied no. To cut a long story short, by 2008, I was enrolled as a PhD student at Plymouth University, doing a fully funded PhD with Heather and Ray Skirton as my supervisors. Not only that, but before my PhD had even started, Heather helped me get my first publication, which must have been an exceptionally slow going and painful experience for her, given I'd never written an academic paper in my life. I think these stories just go to show what a thoughtful, supportive and encouraging person Heather is. It's very difficult to summarize Heather's career, given she has contributed so much to our field. She has a background in nursing and midwifery and became a registered genetic counselor back in 2003, by which time she had already amassed a diploma of psychological counseling, an MSc in healthcare professional education, and a PhD in health psychology. From 2000 to 2004, she was co-director of the MSc in genetic counselling at the University of Wales. And in 2004, she joined the School of Nursing and Midwifery at the University of Plymouth. Her list of professional memberships and roles on external bodies is so long that it would take me almost the entire session if I was to read them out aloud. However, they include president of the International Society of Nurses in Genetics, chairman of the Association of Genetic Nurses and Counselors, and chair of the UK Joint Committee on Medical Genetics. In 2012, she was invited by the European Society of Human Genetics to be the first chair of the European Board of Medical Genetics. Her celebrity status does not end there. In 2015, she was awarded the Education Award by the European Society of Human Genetics for her excellent contribution to international genetics education. That year, she was also invited as guest speaker to the 10th anniversary of the establishment of the MSc in genetic counseling in France. And also that year, she was asked to give evidence to the Medical Genetics Board of Belgium, which directly advises the Belgian government on matters relating to clinical genetics. I think we can all agree that Heather achieved more in 2015 than most of us here probably did. Heather has spent many years developing an evidence base to support the delivery of high quality genetic counseling. She has worked tirelessly in the development of core competences in genetics by health professionals, as well as genetics education. She has also taught counselling skills to a wide range of people in the UK, Europe and worldwide so that they can work more effectively with patients and families. And I know this is something which she is immensely proud of. Heather has a fantastic publication record, having published over 150 academic papers in the, papers in the field, including work on the psychosocial outcomes of genetic testing for patients and families. This has included research into the experiences of patients and families affected by a range of conditions, including Huntington's disease, familial cancer, cystic fibrosis, and intellectual and developmental disability. She has worked tirelessly throughout her career to promote high quality research in genetic counseling and made efforts to ensure its translation into clinical benefit for patients and families. She has been an inspiration to me and I know many others in our field. I can say hand on heart, that it is an absolute honor to award Heather with the 2020 LPAG Award and a treat for all of us here today to listen to her lecture. Thank you very much. Good morning and thank you very much for joining this presentation. The first thing that I have to say is that I am extremely thankful to the ESHG and LPAG committee for conferring the honour of this award on me. And of course, uh, during the process of this presentation, I'm going to be talking about a lot of my work and thanks to the families, the colleagues who've contributed to that. I certainly have not done anything alone and couldn't have done it without you. 
So uh, roadmap seems to be the sort of current watchword at the moment as we're embroiled in this crisis. Uh, so I thought I'd use it to, to just say that during this presentation, I'm gonna be talking a little bit about my beginnings as a health professional, and then some of the work that inspired me quite early in my career, my research and some practical applications of that research and just some thoughts to leave you with you for the future. So I started out very much as a, a general nurse. I trained in the very traditional hospital setting in Melbourne in Australia. And uh, this is me with an arrow pointing to me uh, as really loved my general training. I loved the clinical work and the study and being part of a close group of colleagues. But my real uh, wish was to become midwife. And so I um, trained as a midwife and uh, uh, I'll just go back to that picture. Trained as a midwife and um, worked very happily for about a dozen years as a general midwife in high risk and low risk situations. And it was during that time that I became interested in genetics because I was working in Melbourne in Australia, a very multicultural city. We had a lot of families with thalassemia and I was involved in prenatal testing for those uh, with, with my medical colleagues. And it was such early days that the only way we could test a baby, a fetus, was doing direct cord blood sampling, which was a very risky business. And it was, um, uh, I do remember clearly the day my, my boss walked in the room with waving a paper in his hand and saying, there might be a way for us to test these babies without doing blood sampling, there's this new test called CBS. And it was the first time he'd read of it and the first time I heard of it. So that's how far I go back. But I moved to the UK with my husband in 1988 and I worked as a midwife for uh, a year here, uh, but then I applied for a job as a uh, the first genetic nurse specialist to cover uh, the county of Somerset. And it was back in the dark ages. We did have uh, very little testing. The only testing we could really was doing uh, either chromosome studies or DNA linkage analysis, which was uh, uh, off and on for the families as well. So mostly we were doing uh, genetic counseling using Mendelian inheritance patterns or just empirical risk data. And um, I started to wonder at that time what it was we did that made a difference because being from a, a nursing and midwifery background, I was used to being able to do things for people with treatments and that kind of thing, therapy. And it made a big change to just be able to talk to them. So I really found that a little bit of an adjustment actually. Um, but I did adjust to that and I still kept thinking what it was that made a difference. Um, and even in those early days, uh, just working with families, like everyone else in the clinical area working with families, I became aware that the genetic condition or the genetic diagnosis was associated with um, a lot of um, serious emotional uh, aspect that there was a lot of adjustment to be made. People had a lot of grief about it and often they would express pain. And that in, in, in the context of the clinical setting, there was a lot of emotional talk between um, the, the counsellees and the health professional. Um, I, because it was a new service, I set up a patient satisfaction survey to see how we were doing and um, people registered that they were very satisfied with the service. I realized as I was trying to analyze the data that I hadn't framed a lot of the questions very well. And that was the first time I realized I needed a research training. But uh, uh, actually they did say they were satisfied with the service, but it was difficult for even the patients to say how we helped. And that's still a problem I think today. And genetic, and as we call it now, genomic counselling was and is still a very, very young, relatively young profession. 
Uh, so building a critical mass of evidence to support practice was essential and I think is still essential, and I'll go to that at the end of the talk. But while we had very little published evidence at the time, we were well informed, I think, by the anecdotal evidence of patients. But rigorous evidence is always needed as a basis for a profession, and we needed research, and all research is built on the work of previous investigators. So I want to talk a little bit now about people who inspired me at an early time. And I would say that Newton's quote about standing on the shoulders of giants is really relevant because these were and are giants. Um, the first person who inspired me was Abby Lippman Hand. And uh, I was reading her um, research uh, which was, she, she wasn't a genetic health professional, um, but she, she was a social researcher uh, and, uh, and very much, very keen on social justice. Um, she did a project on um, the interpretation of risk in um, people who were thinking about prenatal testing. And what she found was really had a huge impact on me because she found that um, it didn't really matter what the number was so much. It could be a 5% risk, it could be a 50% risk, that these parents were converting those numbers into a binary risk and saying, well, either my baby will have this or it won't. And I think that that, that was um, uh, very, very meaningful research outcome for us as genetic counsellors. And later when we started to get into cancer genetic counselling and we were thinking about, well, what's the lifetime risk? What's the risk by 50? What's the risk by 60? I used to go back to Abby Lippman Han and think, does this really matter? People maybe just wanna know, am I gonna get cancer or am I not? And then I, my, one of my main clinical areas of uh, interest was uh, families with Huntington disease. And actually my master's project was on how people at risk of Huntington disease tell their children about it. And um, so I went to the, to the literature and there were these wonderful papers by Ard Tibben. And Ard, of course, very well known to you all, um, was one of the first people who started to look at the psychological impact of predictive testing for Huntington disease and later the um, familial cancers. And Seymour Kessler, well, um, he, he just wrote the manual for psychotherapeutic work with genetics. And I had done four years of um, psychotherapy training. And um, as I read his work, it just, meant so much to me. And um, the way he wrote, he wasn't reporting his own research, but it was the um, culmination of all his experience. And uh, he did a wonderful series of um, uh, papers that uh, uh, explored um, what it was to work in genetic counselling in a psychotherapeutic way. And they're still worth reading today. I would strongly recommend them. And the thing that stuck with me about, um, about Seymour Kessler's work was he, he said that we need to focus not on the content of what was going on in the session, but on the person. So a person-oriented genetic counsellor, not an information oriented genetic counsellor. And I still think that that's true today. So now I have to confess that uh, I am at heart a qualitative researcher. And of course, Abby Lippman Han's work in the early days did influence me because I thought it had such depth. And, but also of course, counselling, genetic counselling is about psychology, it's about adaptation and coping and I think that qualitative research is very, very relevant in many cases for our research. And Pope and Mays wrote a great series of papers in the BMJ in 1995 about using qualitative research in health contexts and they described it as reaching the parts that other methods can't reach. And 
it's really difficult for us to measure what we do. And so I think qualitative research is very appropriate for this sort of exploratory work. So I started my PhD, I was a very late developer as an academic and I started my PhD in 1996 and uh, did a uh, study that was titled value, what is the value of genetic counselling from the client's perspective. And it was a mixed method study. I did use some quantitative methods, but also qualitative. And basically, I um, recruited about 40 families that I had no, no contact with as a clinician. And I interviewed them before their clinic appointment, two weeks after and six months after that. And I used three questionnaires, the state tray anxiety inventory, impact of event scale, and need for cognitive closure. But I also did an in-depth interview with the family each time. Now, what I found was using those um, uh, quantitative measures was it was hard to see differences. There were, uh, I did get good data from the need for cognitive closure scale on need for certainty in people seeking genetic counselling, but the anxiety inventory and the impact of event scale didn't really show much difference. But there was very clear messages from the qualitative study and the two main messages I came away with were that being valued as an individual made a difference to accepting the scientific information as relevant. So people would talk about um, little personal touches. He said to me this, or she remembered my mother had died, or that kind of thing from the clinic. And then they seemed to then accept that the information they would be given was personal to them. Whereas other people who didn't feel that personal connection said to me, well, you know, he said it's one in four chance, but how does he know that that relates to my family? We could be one in a hundred that kind of thing. So the personal relationship was important to accepting the scientific information. And the other thing was that the need for um, certainty motivated people to seek genetic advice and they were looking for closure and that enhanced their peace of mind. Um, and even if that was only that, well, I've done everything I can, the expert doesn't quite know, but it's probably genetic that would give them more peace of mind. So during my doctoral study, I was invited to my very first ESHG conference by Domenico Coviello, who's uh, here, this very young man in this picture. And he invited me to a workshop, which was actually prescient in his part, I think, which was on the education and training of what he called non-MD genetic counsellors. Nowadays, we would just use the term genetic counsellor. So I was in Genoa, my first ESHG meeting. Um, I hardly knew anyone. I spent a lot of time looking at posters because I had very few people to talk to. Uh, but one day I was standing next to a poster and a very tall man came and stood next to me. I didn't know who he was. He commented on how relevant one aspect of the findings was, I, I said, yes. And then I thought, oh, I wonder if I'd know his name. And I sneaked a look at his name badge as he walked past me. It was only Victor McCusick. I was very much in awe, of course. And then the next year, 1998, I took some of my doctoral work as a poster to the first MPAG I went to in uh, Paris and for the first time met one of my heroes, uh, Ard Tibbon, who's, I'm very pleased to say, become a long-term colleague and friend. I then went to the University of Cardiff uh, to work with Angus Clark on um, the first Masters in Cardiff, the first Masters in Genetic Counselling in Cardiff, and I did that for four years working with students. But at the same time, I was able to build on my doctoral study. I did a factor analysis study with Evelyn Parsons and Paul Ewings, and we used items drawn from my uh, qualitative research to build a, a factor analysis item bank and then an analyse that and developed an audit tool 
for genetic services based on that factor analysis study. And I'm really pleased to say it's that audit tool has been used in clinical service almost ever since that time. But also that it, um, when Marion McAllister was starting her excellent work on uh, patient reported outcome measures for genetic services, she was able to adapt some of those items and incorporate it into her early work too. And uh, she's still, still building on that work and it's been great value to us in genetic services. Um, one of my, I, I've benefited so much obviously from reading other people's published work. And um, I do think that we have a moral obligation to publish work when, when patients, colleagues, families um, do help us by contributing to our research. Um, and I just went to look at my own um, body of work to see how many of my papers were based on primary research and how many on reviews of other people's research. And um, my primary research involves mixed methods in, in most studies or qualitative. And I have 73 published papers um, based on primary research. Some of those are methods papers. But also I've done uh, used other people's research very thoroughly with 29 uh, reviews um, systematically performed. Uh, but most of them are integrative reviews so that I could include qualitative data in those reviews and um, uh, create a build some um, evidence base for things like standards papers um, and uh, I'll, I'll refer to competences and things like that later. In 2004, I uh, went to the University of Plymouth as a reader and, and later professor and set up my own small research group. It, uh, it was never more than about seven or eight people, but I like to think it was perfectly formed, um, called the Applied Health Genetics Research Group. And here I'm pictured with um, two of my, my two research fellows who were with me for many years and are co-authors on many of the papers I wrote during that time, uh, Leslie Goldsmith and Lee Jackson. So I said that uh, at the start, I wanted to talk about the practical applications of some of my research. And the first one I wanna talk about is a um, Down syndrome screening study. About the time that uh, the Department of Health in the United Kingdom or in England and Wales were going to introduce uh, Down syndrome screening for all pregnant women, uh, Owen Barr and I did this study where we looked at the attitudes to screening in parents and professionals. And one of the things that we found was that the obviously professionals, when they were discussing the screening, they focused on what the risks were, the risk figures of um, having a child with Down syndrome rather than um, anything else. And they were very, very concerned if, or some of them were very concerned if, if women declined the offer of screening, much more so than if they accepted, which led us to think that there was maybe, uh, it wasn't maybe presented as a neutral thing and that there was free choice. Um, the parents didn't focus so much on the risks as what it was would be like to have a child with Down syndrome and they wanted more information about um, parenting a child with Down syndrome, what it was like to live with Down syndrome. And so we were able to feed this back to the Department of Health and they subsequently incorporated these findings into their literature information and training for people offering the screening. And then I was invited to join the Urigentes project and uh, Domenico Copiello uh, was leading a work package and he asked me to come and, and join, uh, which I was very pleased to do. And together we developed an evidence-based set of core competences for genetics for health professionals. And um, these were for specialists for secondary care and primary care, but the specialist core competences 
later became the basis for many of the, the master's programs in Europe and, and outside Europe um, for setting up the curriculum for masters, particularly for genetic counsellors. And these were all used for the um, European Board of Medical Genetics um, registration programs as standards. So we're very proud, I'm very proud of that work. Direct to consumer testing was also just coming online. People were just starting to offer uh, genetic testing online. And so we also did a roadmap for health professionals who might be asked by their patients, you know, should I have a genetic test because of blah, blah, blah. Uh, we produced using a set of systematic reviews and a consensus workshops, we produced guidelines for pre-symptomatic carrier and prenatal testing for European countries. And we particularly included information on the psychological and emotional aspects of testing, which hadn't been done before. One of the pieces of work that I'm most proud of actually is working alongside my colleague, um, Celine Lewis, who uh, was on the Eurogentes project. And she did a lot of work on written information for counsellees. She did an analysis of letters, post-clinic letters and leaflets that were given to um, families by genetic services about their genetic conditional testing. Um, and she also interviewed counsellees and she found that the counsellees were wanting information to help them deal with the emotional aspects of the condition or the testing. But when she analysed the written matter, this was never, virtually never included in the letters or leaflets. And so she um, developed a series of information leaflets with, with colleagues, including myself, and uh, on 15 key topics in now 33 different languages. And these are all still available for either parent, patients to access or for health professionals to download and give to um, their patients in the clinic. Then moved to be part of the RAPID study, um, which was a, a UK wide study um, uh, of all the aspects of non-invasive prenatal testing led by Professor Lynn Chitty. And this was just prior to the introduction of NIPT into the UK um, health services. And I did some qualitative work to assess the impact of using NIPT on families who knew that their children were at risk of a recessive condition. And um, time had moved on a couple of decades from my doctoral study, but I found families were still feeling deep distress about their carrier status and uh, about the risks to their children. Um, but it was very interesting, their feelings about NIPT, which we thought would be, um, you know, a relief to have non-invasive testing as, a, as opposed to the invasive amniocentesis or CVS. And some people were thrilled to have this option, but others said to me um, that while there was an invasive test and there was a risk to the fetus of the test, they had a reason to refuse testing. They could say, you know, well, I don't want to run any risk to, uh, of miscarriage to this, to this baby, so I'm not going to be tested. And when that was removed, they didn't have that sort of excuse anymore with either health professionals or with, with their own family or friends. So some of them didn't see it really as um, a solution. And actually we called the paper an easy test, but a hard decision, which was uh, a direct quote from, from one of the patients. And we were able to feed that back and inform the offering of NIPT to families. So most of you know that a lot of my work has been involved in education and obviously my research has informed the teaching that I do. Um, over the years I've run 25 different residential courses in counselling skills for genetic professionals. Um, they were usually about one a year. Um, 
and practical courses for those needing clinical skills in genetics, maybe um, those new to genetics or um, in working in inherited cardiac conditions or inherited cancers, and always incorporating counselling and psychological aspects of those topics. And as I said, I was with the Masters in Cardiff for four years. But a great joy of my career has been working with the European School of Genetic Medicine. Um, I was asked by Giovanni Romeo to uh, be part of the faculty of the first uh, course in uh, practical genetic counselling, subsequently became a director of that course. And my responsibility was really teaching the counselling skills and, and psychological aspects on that course. Um, and here you see some of my uh, esteemed colleagues, um, Ard and Chris Patch, Francesca Pozzano, and, uh, and worked with so many over the years, hundreds of fantastic students, not only from Europe, but from all over the world. And my last main project before I retired was the GenEquip project where I worked with um, uh, colleagues from five European countries to produce a whole range of online educational resources for people working mainly in primary care but also secondary care. And we focused on the clinical information but also importantly the psychological care and the emotional aspects of conditions or being a carrier, etc. And uh, we were very proud that this was uh, awarded the European Health Award in 2017 for the Benequip project. And it's still up online and I commend it to you. Go and have a look. There's a lot of different uh, fun integrated resources there. So I come to the what now? Um, where do we fit in the Google world? You know, the, the world of genetics I started in is long gone. Uh, we've moved on, but do we fit? Well, we know that the majority of counsellees seek health-related information online, and that uh, goes for genetic people seeking genetic counselling too. And in the future, with only, even their own genome available online, what would be our role? If we don't offer genuine counselling in the true sense of the word, are we doing any better than Google? Well, I wanted to think about this currently and Selena Goodman, my, my colleague and PhD student, did the family web study quite recently where she wanted to see whether having a dedicated um, informational website that families could access and share information through would help families at risk of inherited colon cancer. And families felt that web-based information was very valuable, but they were still worried about communicating the risk to other family members, and they wanted support from health professionals live in a clinic setting as well. In fact, what she found was, even with the availability of screening and treatment, some families had not disclosed the risks to those who could benefit from screening in their families. So we still were not reaching everybody we needed to reach. The families were also concerned with lifestyle advice to help them advise avoid cancer. And I think that's something we're still not doing that well in, in the genetic service. And she found like myself and many others, that psychological adaptation to their own risk status was essential before people could discuss this with relatives. So it seems though, even though we can be overwhelmed by the ever-expanding body of genomic science underpinning our work at the moment, and that's of course important, there's a continuing challenge for us to offer psychological support to families and uh, help them to use the information that's available to support communication in families and reach those who are still unaware of their options. So work's not done. And to just go to other uh, research, what helps counsellors? Well, we know that genetics knowledge is important, but the integration of that knowledge to their own lives is the thing that helps patients. 
that expression of emotions in a clinical setting helps patients process the information we give them cognitively. And when their own emotional cues are responded to by health professionals, they're more likely to recall the content of the discussions that they have with, with us. So my very first paper, peer review paper was called More Than an Information Service, Should Genetic Services Offer, genetic, offer Clients Counseling? And which I argued, yes, we should. And I come full circle because my last single authored paper was in the European Journal, titled almost the same thing, where I'm arguing we still need to be training our genetic counsellors with proper counselling skills and using those in every clinical setting. I would also argue that Times are changing and we still need to keep updated with that in-depth research. In a review of uh, 62 English language publications that I did a quick search for from 2019, if they had genomic or genetic counselling in the title, there were none that actually addressed the needs of counsellees from a qualitative perspective. So I think there's a gap in the research market there. And I would suggest more studies on impact of genetic testing diagnosis in the genomic era with more focus on qualitative or mixed methods to go to drill down. And I would say, if it's not us, who's going to do that? Genetic counselors are the ones who know what the clinical question should be. If it's not us, who will do it? If they're not now, when are we going to get around to it? Apologies to both JFK and Hillel the Elder. And I just want to finish with an anecdote, really, that uh, was very profoundly moving for me. I was fortunate enough to be asked to join the MedGen project. Uh, and this was a project that uh, addressed the need for training in genetics, health skills for doctors and genetic counsellors in Armenia and Israel. And so I was part of a team that was doing a train the trainers um, work package. And we met in Armenia, we met in Israel, both wonderful experiences. Uh, but we also had a train the trainers course in Taunton. And we had Israeli and Armenians there. And the first few days, this is a week course, the first few days we discussed our cultural differences between Armenia, Israel, UK, and how we dealt with those. And it was, it was good, it was great conversation, but we weren't one. And the third day we sat in the training room and I just stayed silent for a while and people asked people to think about, you know, what was in their minds. And we started to talk and we talked about things that were really important. Uh, we talked about the Armenian Holocaust. We talked about the Jewish Holocaust. We talked about our personal experiences of pain and grief and loss. And we talked for about three hours. And at the end, we weren't UK, Armenian, Israeli. We were one. We were one group. And it really brought home to me the power of talking heart to heart, of being open, being those three core conditions in counselling that Rogers talked about, empathy, genuineness, warmth, and back to Kessler, person-oriented, not content. It was one of the most humbling and magnificent experiences of my career and, and I have to say, of my life. And I thank all the other colleagues, I can't possibly name them, but you know who you are, and along the line, we've had a hell of a lot of fun. So thanks to the Applied Health Genetics research, research Team and the other project teams, all my students and colleagues. And I just finished by saying, talked a lot about families and their needs, but you have your needs. Do your work with all your enthusiasm, but remember that actually, Work is not you, you are not work. 
and our own families are our primary focus and our primary support and give them the attention and give yourself the attention that you need to function well both at home and in work. And I thank you again for the honour of this award. Thank you so much, Heather. That was really lovely and a real inspiration to us researchers uh, currently working in the field. I think we've got time for a couple of questions that have just come through. Um, one question here from um, V. Tripathy. Uh, what can we do better as we go forward and try to embrace new technologies whilst continuing to deliver the roles we are in? Well, <clears throat> I notice we've only got four minutes left <laughs> and that's a very big question and I, I would hope that I've tried to, to answer that in some way that I think um, is not to lose sight of, of the human side of, of both ourselves and, uh, and the counsellees. So I think, I think one of the most basic things is that we equip um, our health professionals with um, with counselling training, so that it's it's not something that's tacked on, but becomes a second nature and in, an integral part of every encounter that we have with um, with individuals or families, so that you know it's it it becomes part of that discussion about the the technologies, about what's on offer these days, and how people are going to to utilise those. Um, and I think you can only you can only achieve that if you actually have a really good basis of counselling training, so that the skills are um, you know are as I say second nature to you. And when that happens, it doesn't add time. People have said to me in the past, but we haven't got time for this emotional stuff. It doesn't add time. It actually facilitates the discussion in a much more um, uh, cohesive and coherent way. So I, I think that's one of the key messages that I that I'd give. OK, um, there are some really lovely comments in the chat, which I'm sure you'll want to go and have a, a proper read through at the end of this. And I just wondered if I think you've got your award. Is that right? Yes. <laughs> just wondered if you wanted to have the, the last word. Yeah. So thank you very much. So Heather. I was I was I have to say that when I read the um, citation on the award I was extremely moved and uh, actually uh, moved to tears really and I um, was really really grateful for, for what was said there one of the the last um, line is that um, the SHG wishes to acknowledge her important contribution to the LPAG community through her teaching research publication and friendship and the friendship with is the bit that really got to me so thank you Thanks so much. Uh, thanks everybody who's joined our session today. Um, uh, I know you would have really enjoyed the talk. Um, we'll see you again at the next session this afternoon. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. <laughs>